God restoring Israel as a nation. Now, there are Jews who are Christians, and those people will be raptured. All right? But we talk that God's going to deal with and restore the nation of Israel. Okay? We're not going to talk about that today, but that's what God, God's going to do happen. So, so the nation of Israel will go through the tribulation. So they're going to be here, right? Uh, 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 how God's going to restore Israel is not in Scripture. All we know is that he will restore it. You know, he's sovereign and that he will restore Israel as a nation, right? That does not mean that, in my opinion, that every Jew will be saved, right? But nationally, which in it always mean, obviously may mean most of the people, national, as a nation, God is going to restore Israel. Now, think, think about the restoration of Israel, meaning, uh, meaning, uh, you know, God called the nation, called, called that nation uh, his, his chosen people, right, uh, the apple of his eye. So as a nation, they will be restored. How that happens, Scripture doesn't say, don't say, that I, that I found, okay? Right, any comment? All right. Church is out. Uh, God's going to deal with Israel. But I want to start with, uh, I want to talk about today, start talking about today, the tribulation period. And remember, the church is out of here, okay? Um, so once the church is, is, is removed, is restrained for it, Satan can do whatever he wants to do, including the Antichrist, all right? So uh, in Revelation 6, I'm going to start looking at the Revelation 6, provides an overview of the most difficult and devastating times this planet will ever experience from the Great Tribulation period. Now, and the Great Tribulation period is kind of God's final countdown, you know, uh, before, before the visible return of Christ, Christ setting foot again on the earth, okay? The Tribulation period will be such a severe time uh, that it will be unparalleled in the world history. And, and if it doesn't end, completely destroyed. Johnny, go to Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 and 22. For then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. In those days, if, one, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sale of the elect, those days will be short. It was sick of it. So and I believe that that is dealing with what happens with Israel, okay? For the sake of, for, but for the sake of the elect, uh, uh, no one su will survive. This is what Jesus said. This is so difficult that nobody will survive unless I come back. It's essentially what happens, right? All right? Okay. Now, it's, now the, the, the period and what we're going to talk about today, this period is symbolized by what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Now, and they all come with varying degrees of deception, war, and plague. Okay, so I don't know if we're going to get to all four today, but we'll see. Uh, Jewel, Jewel, let's go to Revelation 6, and verses 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering to conquer. Okay, all right. So the first horseman is on a white horse. Uh, let me just take a quick minute. Uh, uh, it says that the Lamb opened the seals. Now, in Revelation 5, read, get a chance when you get a chance. Revelation 5 indicates that Jesus is the only one worthy to open the seals of the scroll. Okay? 
Let's talk about uh, Revelation 5 when you get a chance. Jesus is, Jesus is the one that opens, that breaks the seals on the scroll, right? Uh, uh, the seven seals are, uh, are one of a series of end time judgments from God. Okay, the seals, we're going to talk about today, the seals, all seven are described in Revelation 6, 1 through 17, and then 8, 1 through 5. But we're only going to talk today about four. Because we're going to talk about the horse, four horsemen that caused havoc on the world. All right, the first one, right, the first one is on a white horse. Right, read that again, Jewel. Six, one, and two. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering to conquer. Okay, that's a bowl, like a bowl, though, but not a bowl. Okay, all right. Uh, now, usually, it's interesting. This was interesting. Usually, when you watch one of the Westerns, right, the guy riding on a white horse is the good guy, <laughs> okay? Uh, 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 the hero. Uh, however, in this case, the rider on a white horse is a villain. I don't, what I don't want us to do. There's another description of a person riding a white horse in Revelation. And I need to point that out because I just said, normally when you see a person on a white horse, you're thinking of the good guy, right? In this instance, it's not. So I don't want you to be confused with, in, in, uh, uh, as you read that, you do look at Revelation 19. Verses 11 and 12. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on that no one knew except himself. Okay. That writer is Jesus. Okay, that is the good guy. Now, I don't want to, here's why I don't want to be confused. So let me, here's the difference. Here's the difference. The first rider has how many crowns? One. All right. The second rider has what? Many. Many, okay. All right. here's, here's the key. In the original language, which is Greek, the word crown is used in Revelation 2, 6, 2, speaks of someone who is conquering, right? Okay, now I'm saying the continent, I'm saying the, I'm saying the, the, the Antichrist doesn't, and we're going to talk about him conquering some stuff, all right? His, that's the, the word used in Revelation 6, 2 is someone conquering, all right? In contrast, the word used for crowns, in Revelation 19, speaks of royalty. Okay? So there's a difference between the two people on the white horses. Got you? You understand? Okay. The word for crown is a word used for someone who's conquering. The word used for crowns speaks of royalty. Okay. This person, huh? Crown, singular. Right. That's the one. And, and remember, Revelation six two is one crown. Revelation in nineteen is multiple crowns, many crowns. Okay. So that speaks of royalty. Now, okay. Now, when the Antichrist comes, we've talked about this a little bit. This is why the white horse thing is significant. Right? When Antichrist comes on the scene, he initially looks like a charismatic, visionary world leader. Okay? He brings 
He brings solutions to the wars of the economy, and there's no war. Okay? Now, remember the church is going to be out of here. Okay? But still you wonder how is this possible based on what we can see today. Okay, so let's let's try to deal with that a little bit. <laughs> okay. Now this charismatic guy is going to be successful in brokering a peace treaty worldwide. That, that would include peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Okay? For a period of time. Yes. Doesn't that happen first? What? Isn't he going to uh, have peace? That's first. Yeah, right. During, during the first, when the church is out, during the beginning of the tribulation period, the first half, or the first three and a half years, there's going to be a time where the world economy appears to be taken care of, and there's peace. Right? Okay? And the, the word the scripture says, and I don't know whether it's metaphoric or not, the scripture says that this person will even help the Jews rebuild the temple. In this, right? Because they, well, they always talk about a temple, the temple being rebuilt. Okay? And, and whether that's a metaphor or not, I don't know, but this this person, the Antichrist, is going to be able, because there's peace now in the Middle East, be able to help them rebuild the temple. Okay, now, but, but halfway through this period, uh, there's going to be the Antichrist then shows his true colors. Right? Halfway through this period, which in Daniel is described as uh, uh, weeks, uh, seven weeks, halfway and years, years, weeks or years, right? So it took seven years, seven weeks, okay? Three and a half weeks or three and a half years, okay, is when the Antichrist then shows his true colors. Okay? And what, what it says is, is that the the scripture says that he, the Antichrist will commit what's called the abomination of desolation. You know what that is? That's mentioned in Daniel. That's mentioned in Daniel. Essentially, what it, we mentioned it in Daniel, there's, there's a prophecy in Daniel. One thing let's talk about about prophecies. Prophecies have a short construction, have a short-term fulfillment and a long-term fulfillment, and that's what uh, we believe that that that. Uh, 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 the gospel writers are talking about when they talk about the uh, abomination of desolation. In Daniel, it talks about a period where, 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 where Israel is conquered and the emperor, like uh, 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 Const, Constantinople, whatever his name is, uh, Epip Epiphanes is the last, so right? Uh, uh, in the temple, uh, sacrifices uh, uh, pigs, right, right, rather than the sacrifice, right, set up, and, and he wants to be worshipped himself. That's in Daniel, in Daniel, uh, in Daniel, I think the seventh chapter. Well, remember we talked about that, all right? Here's the point. The point is that after three and a half years, the Antichrist uh, will do something to, to de defame the name of God. In fact, he will want to be recognized as God, okay? Whatever he does, right, after three and a half years. All right? Okay? Um, we're, talking, we've been, we're talking about the guy on the white horse with the Antichrist, we're talking about the fact that he will, for three and a half years, appear to be a world a savior. It would appear to be. Take care of the economy and take care of the wars, right? Okay? Got it? All right. Now, so let's look at that. So how, well, how is that? Does that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's, all right. Take take a look at uh, this. We're, we're jumping around a little bit, but all you get hopefully all of this stuff will get tied together. Um, Houston, go to Revelation 13. 
16 through 17. Remember what I said, this charismatic leader is going to take care of all the economic woes. Right? But here's what happens after he, after he shows his true colors. Uh, verse 13, 16, and 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast the All right. Okay. Let's try to deal with this. People have struggled with this for years and years and years. Where is this mark? Right? Mark is a name. Where is it? How is it possible? It's a computer chip that they are right now experimenting with. They got it. They got some places right now that's actually using it. It has been implanted in their head. The fingers. And when they go to touch, the door will open. Well, here's what I say. That is possible. That's possible. I, I, I won't say that it is a computer chip, but it's possible, right? That's possible. Let, so just, just, just look at some things today to show, to show how all of this could be possible, all right? Now, remember, remember... <laughs> When John wrote Revelation, he was writing to the people from a first century perspective, right? He was trying to describe things that we know as commonplace today with words that he knew, okay? Now, before computers became a part of our lives, it was hard. Say people in the 17th century, 18th century, they would, could, would, could not figure out how this prophecy could be fulfilled, right? In our, in our generation, we've seen the development of technology, so we can see how it's possible for this to be fulfilled. For example, okay, for example, it's getting pretty close now to the ability to function, for an economy to function without Cash, Whoa. right? Without exchanging Whoa. dollars or writing checks, you can do it things electronically. Okay, if you do things electronically, then it's possible for an individual or group of individuals to control the entire economy, wow. isn't it? And that's that's possible. So that that's so so that that's possible, right? Because of the technology. What Houston said is also possible. Right? Nobody knows what this mark is. You know, it may be a PIN number, and so you can so you, you can can transact business. Right? There's technology where chips are in, you know, chips are inserted in dogs now. Now, right? Okay, there are chips that can be inserted, and some have been inserted in individuals that would have all of your personal information on it, right? So we can see today that it's possible for these kinds of things to happen, for the kinds of things that John is describing in Revelation to happen, right? And I don't believe we've, the technology is, is, we've seen technology advance to the extent it could. It could be. All right? Okay, in the course of the comments, okay, that, that takes care of the first horse. The first horseman comes and looks like a good guy riding on a white horse, says peace for a period of time, and then he begins to require certain things to happen in order for you to function. Okay? Begins to require whatever the mark is for you to transact business. Whatever you got to do to live, there has to be some way for you to be able to do that. That, you know, However, technology allows us. We don't know what that is today, but we can see that it is possible. Right? All right? That's the first horseman. The second horseman, right, um, since Jeanette just, just got here, 
Uh, let's have her read Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. So the first horse, the first horse is a white horse, right? So the first horseman is riding on Here's the second horse. Uh, okay. All right, three and, three and four. Three and four of Revelation chapter six. The second seal conflict on, on earth. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. As another horse and fiery red went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there, and there was given him okay, now remember, the, the rider on the horse is the Antichrist. Okay? So now he rode on a white horse, right? Took care of stuff, took care of the economy, took care of war, right? All right? Now that he's got that squared away, got to figure out how to control the economy and to control the information of people, right? Okay? So now, the red horse, remember now, this, the, the Antichrist is a man, but that be given the power to do stuff by Satan. Okay? Right? Holy Spirit's out of here, church out of here, Satan's here, Satan's give, given full reign now, right? Okay. So the Antichrist, he's riding the horse, so the second, the next horse that is riding the red horse will bring war. We've had peace, we'll bring war. So the second window, when the Lamb opens the second seal, right, it, 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 it tells you that there's going to be war, great warfare breaks out over there. After the Antichrist, right, has harnessed the economy, and the military system, because he's got everybody squared away, right? He knows everybody's personal information, whatever by whatever means, right? Because of technology, then war breaks out. But we want to remember now for sure is that the devil, the devil, Satan is behind war. Period. Even today, right? Man, just think about what is happening in certain wars, right? Think about think about Hitler killing killing. Uh, Jews, we thought we can think about the atrocities, people being beheaded, and all this kind of stuff, right? And man at its worst is not capable of some of the horrific things that we've seen. Man at its worst is not capable of doing what Hitler did. Man by himself is not capable, doesn't have the capability of doing that. It's got to be directed by an evil force, right? Okay, so so Satan is behind all of these atrocities. He's behind what's going to happen uh, with this when the second seal breaks. Okay, how is that possible? How is how is it possible that we have wars of uh, 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 war throughout there? How is that possible? Again, it's, you know, I said war breaks out everywhere, right? When, so how is that possible? Let's look at let's look at today, and say how how is that possible? Oh, it's so easy, so easy because it's the devil against the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right, right. But let, let, let's say what the devil uses has got to use people, right? So we the earth today today, man has the capability of wiping out all of mankind. It's cap as capability right now. There's enough nuclear weapons uh, around. Uh, the, 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 the estimate is there's, a, there's, a, there's more than 60,000 hydrogen bombs in the world today. As we heard today, it will be threatening to use nuclear weapons. Right, okay. Right, so 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 that's that's enough that's enough power 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 in all of these nuclear weapons to destroy the world in a flash. Right? Okay. Here's a statement one scientist well some one scientist was asked, uh, which weapons would be used in World War Three? Here's what he said. I'm not sure exactly which weapons would be detonated in World War Three, but I can tell you 
which ones would be used in World War IV? Rocks. Because that's all, right? That's, so rocks, right? Right, rocks would be all that's left to fight with, right? Okay, okay. All right, so 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 here's what happens. We we here's what happens uh, during uh, during, the, during the Great Tribulation period. We got we got the first part of it is going to be peaceful. Uh, it's going to be no peace. The world's economy will be squared away. Then what what once it got once the Antichrist has control of the economy, world economy and control of the ability of people to function, then war breaks out, right? Directed by Satan, but using the Antichrist. So we got war all over, everywhere, we're, 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 we're war, right? Okay, now what happens, though, what happens after you have, assuming it's a nuclear war, of all the world, the nuclear, this has got a nuclear holocaust, right? Okay. So let's open, let's open the third seal. Johnny, Revelation 6, 5 and 6. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of heat for a day's wages, and six pounds of forest for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. Oh, okay, okay. So after you know, the white horse and the red horse, right? the red horse means war, right? right? Over the world. A devastating war, all right? Okay. Then the next horse is a black horse, right? right? The rider, and, and it's the Antichrist, riding on a, on, a, on a black horse, holding, and it says, it says holding scales in his hand, okay? Uh, John says people have to work all day to earn this little food. This is the, is the description of what would happen after a war that destroys everything, right? What happens? There's, no, there's a famine. Right. Everything is destroyed, right? There's a global famine, right? That's that. So this is the third seal. So, so we got we got three and a half years of, 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 of it's nice, it's okay. Then we got uh, then we got war, a global war, and then that famine. After, you know, uh, 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 the description of a global famine is is what scientists would, would predict would happen after a nuclear war. Right, that'd be because because of radioactivity, the world's food supply would be affected. Right, so uh, so so if we if, if, if we if, if we if we sense a nuclear war, whatever war, but if we sense a nuclear war, again, what I want to try to say is looking at what we know today. John's writing to people who have no idea, and us looking at what we can see today, we can see this kind of thing happening. Right. Uh, after a nuclear war, if it's a nuclear war, whatever it is, it destroys the food supply. Okay? So we got, we got peace, economic harmony, we have a war, unit war that destroys everything, and we got global famine. All this has happened during the tribulation period. So it's good we're gone, right? Right. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then, then we have the fourth horse. Right, this fourth horse to ride on. This fourth horse is not the Antichrist. Read uh, your Revelation six, seven, and eight. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, "Come and see." So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with swords, with hunger, and death, and by the beast of the earth. All right, okay. 
So what this is is that the four, a fourth of whoever is left, <laughs> right? A fourth of whoever is left. Yeah. All right. For it's four, a fourth of whoever is left. Then are killed by sword. You know, people, you know uh, it could be war, it could be people, because we got a global famine, right? It could be violence of some kind. Kill, fourth is kill, killed by sword. They die of famine or disease. And what this is, wild beast. And um, how is that even possible? I don't know. I mean, you know, t- today, today, for example, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll, let me give you a, a good example. Today, if you if you go out, let's say you go to Africa and you go on a safari, right, and you see a pride of lions, right? Uh, you're in a vehicle, right? What would happen to you? If you got out of that vehicle and walked up to the private line, yeah, yeah. right? Okay, all right. Now, okay. So, 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 so the, the the point is, all everything's taken out of the way. Now, the, all, all your protection has been taken out of the way, uh, but and because of the fall, because of the fall of man, animals are not. You know, you got wild animals, right? You, you can domesticate it, but it's because of the fall, right? Yes, you were saying? Yeah, see, uh, well, not the way I see it, because I don't know nothing. Although, <clears throat> these viruses that are coming from the monkeys, the, the one in, in China where they uh, thing, whatever that was, and they brought the uh, COVID-19, it's going to be elevated to where... They, the beast means like these animals. They're going to put these viruses that's just going to kill everybody. No, no, no. Yeah, but I mean, and I, I guess that's possible. But what we're trying to look at, trying to look at, at, at today, right? Uh, so, and that is possible. So, so, but, but what, what, what the key is here now is just, just, just. Key I want us to understand is the person on this horse. This is not the antichrist. So who, what does it say? Who's who's on this horse? Death and Hades. Death and Hades, right? Death and Hades are on this horse, right? So, so we're talking, we're talking about, so we're talking about uh, the whoever's on this horse, right? Causes death, right? And Hades is a place that people would go after death, right? Christians, the church. Well, let me let me try to describe this. Let me try to describe this. Until Christ came, and we got caught up in the air, everyone from our bodies, everyone who died, until Christ came. This is, I'm not talking about us. Until Christ came, everybody who died went to Hades. Hades is a place where anyone who to die. Now, here's, here's why I say this. Here's why I say this. When in First Thessalonians, right, it says when Christ comes, those who died in Christ will be raised first. Correct? All right? That would mean until Christ comes, they are somewhere, right? Okay? Does it make this, what, this is, what I'm saying makes sense, right? If it doesn't, say so. All right? When Christ appears, the dead in Christ will rise first and all who remain. All right? Okay? So until Christ comes and we just caught up in the air, everyone who dies goes somewhere. Right? We're talking about body. I know the scripture says to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord, but that's a spiritual thing. Okay? Everyone who dies is caught somewhere. It's Hades, right? Uh, now, the person who's riding on this horse is death, which means, in this, in this case, we're talking about death. In this case, we're talking about separation from God. When we describe, we're, just, we're not talking about just physical death. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. With death and Hades. So Hades, Hades, uh, those that are there in Hades are going to be completely separated from God because they're done. Okay. So turn this out. So follow me. Am I making sense? He said, for, okay, before um, uh, Jesus died on the cross, the people that died, they were in hell? No, I said Hades. Hades and hell. Hades is not hell. Okay, that's what I wanted to, um, because I was thinking hell no. and Hades was No, 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 Hades is not hell. Hades is not hell. Okay, what's the difference, please? Okay. Hell, hell is the place where where Satan and all those who don't accept Jesus uh, uh, when he after he returns are kept. That's hell. Hades, Hades is a. a I'm gonna try to describe it. Hades is a is a place where those who die uh, are hell. Everybody, everybody, every, well, let me put it this way. Everybody who dies yeah. goes to Hades, believer or not. Whether they're, good or bad. Whether they're a believer or not. Right? Okay. Now, when Christ comes, and what we're talking about is resurrected bodies, okay? There's a difference. When you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, when you die, Right? Your spirit or your soul is with the Lord. So to be absent from the body is to be with Christ. Right? Okay? So follow me? Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. Your rest, your body, which will be resurrected, or whatever your whatever is constituted as your body, <clears throat> is in Hades. Oh, so your spirit is with the Lord. Right. Christ. Correct. It's in right, right. Cause, cause, oh. cause what, the, what the Bible tells us is everybody, everybody, every person that's ever been born, their bodies will be resurrected to either be, right, to be either with God for eternity, or to be in hell or separated from God for eternity. Oh, Hades is the emperor. But, but yeah, you, you, use that. you can use that word right there. Now, don't, don't confuse it with purgatory. It's an interim. There is no purgatory. It's an interim, okay? Is it supposed to be a bad place? No, Hades is not a bad place. You know, I, I think about when you um, have Bible study at Jehovah's Witnesses. As a child, I never felt... Oh, saying hell, yeah. and they would allow me to say Hades. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hades and hell are different places. Now, we're going to end with this, and 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 we'll talk about more about the four thoughts a little next week. We're going to end with this because I think this is important to know about Hades. Okay. Jesus tells a story, not a parable. It's a, a for real story of two people who died. One's name is Lazarus, who was a beggar, and the other guy was a rich guy, right? He took that, and Jesus named them. So this was not a parable. This is a story of people who they people knew, all right? These two people died, right? And what I just said was they would go to Hades, right? right? Now, in Hades, then, obviously, there is a separation in Hades, Lazarus, it says, in the, it says it's in the bosom of Abraham, right? The other guy is on the side of what's described as a gulf, a wide gulf, right? Abraham asked, about, oh, the, the old rich guy, what his name was, asked Abraham to dip, to have Lazarus dip his finger in water. To, okay, but there's a chasm which nobody can cross. That's, this is in Hades, Okay. Because both of them are there. Okay? So Hades is a place where everybody goes. Everybody dies, right? Right? 
you either on the on the uh, Abraham side or the other side. Okay. There's no community. There's no way to interact. Okay. Follow me. Is that take care of that? After that, okay. Hades and hell are different. People use the word interchangeably, but they are not the same. Hades is not hell. Hell is a different place. So, Pastor Jacob said, all right, so Hades is, you know, good and bad. Hades, okay? Um, there's a rich guy where he's just in um, the bad part of the side of Hades, yeah. okay? So, uh, really, what's the difference between Hades and hell? Because it seems to me like Hades and hell is one and the same. You know, I heard what you just said. Like, okay, you go to Hades and you're a business, you're then you're going to go to heaven. But um, Hades, if you're bad, you're on the bad part of Hades. Yeah. So what is the difference between Hades and hell? Because isn't it miserable? Well, no, 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 it's not. Because remember now, there are two parts to Hades. Okay, one part, Lazarus, it says Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. Right. right? So he's able and able to relax. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. The other, the rich guy, is on the, is on the other side of the gulf, mm -hmm. and he's tormented. He, he needs what? Okay. You asked the question. You asked, no, you asked the question. What's the, what's the difference between Hades, was Hades and Hell the same? No. If you want to describe Hades, you take, take that, take, 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 uh, take the bad part. Let's call, let's call it whatever. Let's, let's, no, no, I don't want to call it that. Let, let, let's take Let's take that. Let, okay, let, let, let's take the wrong side of the tracks. Okay, right. okay, okay, let's just use that. Yeah. <laughs> let's take the wrong side of the tracks. In a city, you have a, a front section okay. and you have a poor section, right? right? The, whole sec, the whole city is not poor. Right. You have one part that's not the front and one part that's not. Do it that way, mm -hmm. all right? They're not the same. Hell and Hades are not the same. Hell is a different place. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> For the sake of argument, okay, we could say that. But it's a short trip between Hades and hell because uh, God was tormented yeah. and he oh. wanted somebody, he wanted a drink. Right. Just to do, right. You know, right. Oh. So it's a short trip oh. between oh. Hades oh. and hell. Right, right, but, but it's, also, it's, also, it's also a very short trip. From Hades to let's use the word heaven, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So what I want, I want, what I want us to understand is your, the bodies. We will be <coughs> bodies will be resurrected, oh. right? Okay. Bodies will be everybody will be resurrected. Everybody. Okay. And you spend your time, you spend eternity. In the presence of God, call that heaven, okay. right? call it paradise, okay. all right? Or you spend your time separated from God where there will be torment, right? right? Call that hell. Okay. Yeah, gnashing your teeth. I mean, and, and, and I, I think that's a metaphor. Gnashing your teeth, I think it's a metaphor. Uh, and the fiery and all that kind of stuff. I, I think that's a I think that's a metaphor of torment, torment between not being able to be in the in the paradise of of, of being with God. There'll be separation with Right. And, and the reason I say that is is this 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 is described by Jesus. There is a separation. There's a place when, because both of these people died. Right. Both of these people were in the same general vicinity. There was a gulf between them. Right. right? Lazarus was with, on the good side, with, let's just say the front side, right? And the other guy was on the other side of the tracks. 
But Jewel says it's correct. It's a short trip, but it's a tr- short trip in either direction. So if you if you use, use the word, yeah. people use the word hell metaphorically most times, right? For a bad place or a bad time or a tough time. Uh, hell was never hell was never designed for people. God did not create hell for people. Hell, God created hell for the Satan, right? Now people will go there, but that was not. It was not designed for for, for individuals, right? It goes that so hell is a different place. Yep. The rest of the even though you're not necessarily resting, resting. the good side of Hades or well, yeah, yeah, here's what we can rest. We, we can we can rest in the flesh. So, so you know, when well, we get caught up in all this stuff, uh, we we can rest in the fact that 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 that, that, that God loves us. We'll be with Christ. We'll be in the presence of the Lord when we die. Right? We can rest. We all can rest. In, we can rest in the fact that that when we are resurrected, our resurrected bodies will be with the Lord and not separated from the Lord, wherever that is, okay? Uh, if you, but if you're if you separated, it's going to be torment, yeah. okay? If you're, with, if you're with the Lord, it's going to be uh, paradise, okay? Hopefully, now, and we, we can talk about this as long as we need to because I want us to be clear and understand that so that we don't get two things. One, we don't have to go through any of this, okay? It's two, it's good for us to know because we don't want anybody else to go through the other stuff, right? Uh, <clears throat> it's good for us. It's good for us. It's good for us to know. <clears throat> one other thing. One more. One, 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 this, this is the last point uh, for today. We'll, we'll talk about this more today, but take a look at the horseman, uh, uh, the, the horse. Uh, the fourth horse is 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 a pale horse, right? Okay. Uh, now, the, and it's, it's, the, the other translations of this is sickly. It's, the, this horse is a sickly horse because of of, of it's a corpse like color, right? Right. Uh, 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 some some translations say. Uh, uh, described this as riding on an ashen, which is a pale or greenish, uh, or an ashen horse, right, or a pale green horse. Uh, uh, so, so death and Hades is riding on a horse, but the horse itself looks looks sickly, right? Mm-hmm. Right. In this scene, uh, uh, death and Hades is, person- is personified on earth, but but what what we can remember. Is, and, 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 and is is that uh, well, here's what I want us to look at. I'm going to end with this verse, okay? and this verse is for all of us. Okay, we're going through all this death and Hades riding on this this horse, and whether wherever however we describe death and Hades or hell, right? Uh, however we describe that, I want us to end with this scripture, and then we'll take up next week. Uh, and I want Joe, I want you to read it. Yeah. We read First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verses fifty-four and fifty-five. Fifty-four and fifty-five. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. So when this corruptible has put on any corruption. And this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Okay, that's that's, that's all. The, 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 main, the main thing I want us to read is, 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 is this. Death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? Yeah. That's the thing I want us want us to remember, right? Hades and hell, a significant, 
knowledge is, is good. We need to know these things. It's good for us to have knowledge and these kind of discussions. Uh, but for us, death has been defeated. There's no sting in death. There's no victory in death. Even though we will all die unless Christ comes back before we die. Right? We'll all die. If Christ doesn't come back, we'll die. Our spirits will be with the Lord. Right? Whatever shape our body's in, whatever's left or remains, will be in a place described as Hades. I, I was enlightened because all the time um, with, you know, um, growing up in the church and stuff, it was never pointed out to me that Hades was different from hell. It was, right. they're one in the same. Yeah, but, mm -mm. Hades is not, is not hell. Hades is not, and the best, and I think the best example that I can have come up with is is the story. And again, this is a story. This is not a parable of Jesus with the two people who died. And I know that story. They went to Hades. Still, 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 it was, you know, Hades and hell was one in the same. So thank you, Pastor Jacob, for um, enlightening me today on that. Okay. All right. We're done. Any, any other questions? Any comments? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it actually say in the Bible, when one dies, the soul the spirit The the Bible. Uh, John's John's question was: Is there anywhere in the Bible where it says that when a person dies, the soul of the spirit leaves? There's no scripture that I'm aware of where it uses that term those terms. Uh, what it says, the closest I think it comes to saying that is that to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. So that would mean that if something leaves the body, it's somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. To be absent from the body is to be with the Lord, right? That's, what, that, that's the closest I think it says. Okay. Well, I mean, people always say, there's souls gone with it. Well, I think I mean I mean I mean that, that, that you could say that you, I mean you could say that you could say be up in the be with the Lord. I mean when you die, that, you know you, whatever your soul or your spirit is going to be with God. That's that's okay. But I think the, the those words, as I know, as far as I know, those words are never used in Scripture or the term. And the closest to that that is saying to be up in front of the to be with the Lord, which I which I mean he says the same thing. Huh? Be absent from the body to be with the Lord. It's in one of the Corinthians. Yeah, I think. Sir, 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 no, sir, 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 do me a favor. Uh, can, if quickly, can you find the scripture that says to be absent from the body to be with the Lord? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. Second Corinthians okay. five eight. Second Corinthians five eight. Okay. Sec Okay, Second Corinthians five. Read it for me. It says, "It says, um, I'll read it in the EXB." So, so I say that we have courage or are confident. We really want would be prefer to be away from the body and to be home with the Lord. Okay, and and and, and, what, what, and, and the, the context that was written in it was a Paul. Paul, Paul said that, that I, you know, I could die in the prison context. I could die, but I need to be around to help you guys. Uh, I would much rather be dead uh, because if I'm dead, I'm separated from the Lord. But, uh, you know, I'm separate. I'm not, I'm not with the Lord. But to, if I died, it's better for me to be with the Lord. That's the context that's written in. Written in right? to, be, to be absent from the body means dead. I'm dead. Right? It's to be with the Lord. Okay. Second Corinthians five eight is that what it is? was that it, Sarah? Yes, correct. Okay, right. Okay. Any other comments? Well, we don't have to expand on this today, but <laughs> the other the other point where um, I got confused was um, someone said 
um, you know, when you die, you're a thing. You're a thing. Okay. Uh, let, let, yeah. let, 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 let me, let me try to deal with it. Didn't she say I couldn't hear her? Yeah. Well, well, what she, what she said was, uh, what, what she had heard, and, and, and her people have said in the past, that when you die, you're asleep. Uh, 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 Jesus talks about that. He talks about Lazarus being asleep uh, uh, rather than dead. And so a lot of people think soul sleep, you know, uh, uh, that's, you know, well, let me put it this way. Let me, let me, let me put it this way. Based on, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we said that was asleep, okay? Based on the story Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man, right? Okay. Based on that, they were both dead. You need me? Yeah. Yeah. No, but what you need me? Okay, give me a, give me a second. Let me ask, ask this one question. Let me ask this one question. Based on the story Jesus says, right? Then uh, Lazarus and this and the other guy were not asleep, were they? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So they were right, right. So they they were into, So so I think the term soul sleep is misused. That's a personal opinion. Oh, like rest in peace. Right, like, like rest in peace. That's, it's, that's a personal opinion because based on what Jesus said, if you were dead, they were able to interact. Oh. 